Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Tea With. Uh, I am Jaina Alexander. Hello, everyone. I'm April Sigmund Marks. Uh, and tonight we will be talking with Colon Studi, uh, who is uh, Colon. His first professional job at 14 was in Among the Shadows Haunting with Gary Farmer and Delana Studi at the College of Santa Fe. A graduate of the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in Los Angeles, he is a company member of Native Voices at the Autry, where he gave standout performances in Bingo Hall by Dylan Cheeto and They Don't Talk Back by Frank Henry Cash. Katowski, which also ran at the Lajala Playhouse and Perseverance Theater in Alaska. Colon played Elias Budano in the Marin Theater production of Sovereignty by Mary Catherine Nagel, reprising the role at Lensic Theater in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Colon would like to send his best wishes to everyone who is suffering from the COVID-19 pandemic and thank everyone at Colon at Thumbprint Studios for allowing him to revisit his role uh, that he just talked with us about for our uh, uh, reads and listens uh, that's close to his heart. Um, tonight, we're gonna be talking about why representation matters, a second generation look at the entertainment uh, industry. So Colon, welcome. Why, thank you for having me. <laughs> Gee when you learned your own bio, it's kind of cringy. <laughs> I was expecting, but I do love your bio. I think it's great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. I'm super excited to be doing this. Um, working with you guys uh, with the uh, They Don't Talk Back material was so much fun. I just had to come for a second round. Yay. Um, hey. Uh, yeah. Thank, thank you for having me. Um, of course. So our first question for you tonight is, what is your current obsession? Oh boy, okay, I have a couple at the moment. First of all, NBC just brought back The Weakest Link. Uh, so that brings me much joy in just a, a game show. And uh, it's now hosted by Jane Lynch, who I think is just a, a glorious goddess of comedy. Uh, so her just ripping into people about their lack of knowledge of really hard trivia questions brings me a, a lot of happiness in this <laughs> in these times. And, and the, uh, my other obsession is uh, the podcast Yo Is This Racist uh, featuring Andrew T. and Tommy Newsom. Um, and it's just great because the whole format of the show is just them, you know, talking about the most racist things that happen that week, which, you know, over the past four years is quite a lot. So there's quite a lot to talk about on the show, uh, as well as they also uh, take calls from listeners that are basically them trying to tiptoe around racist questions, and then they answer them very honestly, which is... All just, right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there, if it were. Just super uncomfortable, but just great. And they're super funny, so I can't, you know, recommend it enough. Uh, I just wrote that down so that I can go and check that out. I'm like, ooh, that sounds it's, fantastic. It kills me. It's also uh, filled with, um, the episodes are also filled with guest um, hosts as well, which uh, for the month of November, they actually made a point of asking Native comedians to come in. So you have, you know, guys like Lucas Brown Eyes and Joey Clift, who are both writers here in the industry in Hollywood. Um, and it's just terrific because it's it's representation without it you know, necessarily, besides it being Native Heritage Month, you know, hinging on, um, you know, a Native topic necessarily. So it's just a, a great show that I can't recommend enough. And it, it, it kills me anytime I listen to it. Of laughter, of laughter. Um. <laughs> awesome. Definitely checking that out. And we will have that in, uh, we'll put a link in our blog. Yeah, we we'll link it in the blog. So that, yeah, so that people can find it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, tell us a little bit about your artistic journey that's brought you to where you're at today. Oh boy. Well, it all began a long time ago in a sleepy theater in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Why am I starting it this way? Um, <laughs> so, the first, I guess, like, it, where my journey began is my mom likes to tell me this story. 
quite a lot. Uh, we were sitting in a theater watching a children's production of, I want to say, Jack and the Beanstalk. And she just remembers me thoroughly enjoying it. And then once it was done, she recalls me turning to her and being like, hey, when do I get to do that? And so I guess I caught it early, the acting bug, which, you know, is a fun way to put it. And, you know, I um, just loved doing theater in high school. I was the um, president of our drama club uh, and things of that nature. I actually um, was part of a clowning group in high school for a short period of time, uh, <laughs> which was actually almost the, the poster for this, for this talk. Um, and then after high school, I decided to go to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, um, which was a good decision for me at the time. <laughs> but that's also where I started to realize just how little there was out there for Native actors because, you know, we had to do these things called play reports and which just required us to read a lot of plays. And of course, as I was going through them, I was like, oh, huh, not a, not a whole lot of Native representation. And oh, geez, not a lot of whole, not a whole lot of Native authors on these shelves. That's um, disheartening. So fun place to be. And then I got... <laughs> Um, hooked up with this company called Native Voices at the Autry, whose sole mission is to produce new works by Native playwrights. And so that has kind of been my artistic home since then. And I've just, you know, kind of bopped around trying to figure out, like, what I, exactly I'm doing with my um, career, honestly. But I've been really blessed to work on a lot of, you know, um, specifically Native projects. And... Yeah, it's been it's been a wacky journey <laughs> so far. Um, and, and at one point, I was even like touring as as a musician with a native artist, which uh, could almost be a topic for a different time. Um, but yeah, so so far, that's kind of been my whole journey into this whole thing. And obviously, we'll talk about it more. But it was also, you know, greatly influenced by you know my childhood uh, growing up with the industry is how I'll put it for now. So in terms of rep representation, you know, for anyone out there who's maybe like, well, what, what do you mean by that? Um, could you maybe tell us what representation means to you and what your definition of that is? Well, <clears throat> Webster's definition of representation <laughs> is, but <laughs> one of them is much more pertaining to what we're discussing. Um, the description or portrayal of someone or something in a particular way or as being of a certain nature. So what that means to me is that um, as human beings, representation is extremely important, right? Because that's kind of one of the places where we are kind of forced to base off like what we are, right? So for example, like being a native person watching, you know, film and television, it gives a very, you know, one dimensional quality of, of how most of the industry like perceives native people. And so the reason why it's important is because representation also means how everyone else is viewing you, right? Mm -hmm. Whether we like it or not. And whether whether that you know uh, representation is true or not. So, to me, it's really to me it's really about um, taking consideration of how society may or may not view a certain group of people. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm going to put a period on that because that feels like the most coherent way I'm going to put it. Um, which, <laughs> you know, hey, that was an answer, I guess. Yeah, well, and it sounds like, you know, you're speaking to this idea that you don't get to choose how you are represented or how you, you see, other people see you um, through the lens of media or the entertainment industry, um, which really sucks. As someone who likes to be in control of things. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> that yeah, that sucks. And what what have been some of the the consequences that you've either witnessed or experienced from these like misrepresentations? I'm so glad you asked that. So here's the thing, when when you know native people are represented in such a small box and and I'll I'll give the industry some credit that it's gotten better over the past like 20 years or so but you know a lot of people's uh, you know reference for native people are still like dances with wolves and last mohicans and that kind of thing you know stuff that came out almost 20 years ago at this point and even those depicted you know the old leathers and feathers interpretation of native people so Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that when most of popular culture and media still portray Native people in, you know, a a color of like being a token of a of a lost era, a lot of people start to think of it that way, right? And then when you take in consideration what the actual Native population of the United States is currently, and it is a much smaller population, most people won't have an actual interaction with a native person potentially all of their lives. And then you go to, you know, towns that border reservations and they themselves have a very, you know, um, their own concrete idea of what native people are, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's gotten better because in many ways um, the industry is through what I like to call them are like very special episodes, <laughs> have like done their best to try and like bring natives into, you know, the modern light, but it's always under the guise of like, oh, they're a spiritual healer, or oh, the class is taking a trip to a local reservation, um, and they can't seem to. It's almost like they're not allowed to exist out of, um, you know, those kinds of parameters, and. You know, what that means, at least I think, like on the grand scale of things, when other people are seeing that, they're just like, oh, hey, cool, natives, hooray. Um, and then when native folk are seeing themselves uh, portrayed on television, it's like, oh, hey, great. But it's always just like a little snippet or, um, you know, a sample of what those people are actually like and they're always you know serving in the position of you know wise old india or you know <laughs> unfortunate time where they're you know playing a drug dealer or something like that which luckily doesn't happen as often because people love they love the noble indian more on screen than anything else which don't get me wrong love that more than like having drunk indians all over television mm -hmm. but at the same time that really colors them as like keeps them in like the stoic um, the stoic idea and that we don't have humor, like haven't been able to progress past, um, you know, <laughs> since Columbus discovered us and that kind of thing. Discovered. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds like there's, there's still a lot of um, characters that are native that are written as stereotypes or tropes. And I mean, could you talk a little bit about like why it's important that we break away as an industry or even media in general from stereotypes and tropes and, and why having like a representation of a full, you know, modern human living their lives who just happens to be native is, is so important. Awesome question. Um, the reason it's important is kind of, I, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but so, when the representation is already so slim, that is what's going to be in the forefront of people's minds when, you know, the topics of, you know, talking about Native people come up. And it's, it's also, I just think it's so important to show them as, as human beings simply because, well, A, we are. <laughs> like, we're modern people living in modern society while still, you know, trying to keep, you know, our, our cultures alive and that kind of thing. But we're still very, you know, like, 
individual members of communities as well. Like here in Los Angeles, who is actually one of the largest populations of urban um, Indians in the in the country. Like we're all over the city, and that's because you know it was obviously a great influx of us from you know different states because there were actually certain incentives about getting officer reservations and yada yada yada. So all sorts of fun political stuff that you know don't have time to get into. But um, I think it's just it's just important because we need to be seen as as living, breathing human beings, you know, and it goes beyond just like showing up for a very special episode, you know, to be a spiritual advisor. It means like just being a doctor in an ER or, you know, just even just being as like a small part of like being a waiter or that kind of thing. Because I know so many, like any other actors, that's how a lot of native actors have like, you know, stayed afloat is by being human beings, which is something that the industry either wants to avoid or, to, you know, just don't even know how to handle because it is representation itself is a very, very, you know, for native peoples, it's very tricky because one point I want to bring up and sorry to get controversial, but I think one of the reasons why indigenous representation is so, um, scarce on especially on television here in the united states is because inherently you know indigenous issues are inherently political issues right because as soon as you're talking about something that's really affecting the tribe you're nine times out of ten talking about either a local government or the federal government or you know our favorite pals in the oil industry and that kind of thing uh, so it's it's a, a tricky line to you know to walk on but at the same time <laughs> it's like come on just get your together because everyone you know if you're gonna be brave enough to tell uh, tell other people's stories and also allow these people to tell their own stories let natives tell their their own stories for once yeah have have you seen any growth in like Growing up around the industry, growing up having gotten the bug pretty early, have you seen any growth in that way of like more native people telling their own stories? Or do you, I mean, it sounds like there's still a lot of like we have a far way to go, but have you seen some improvement and like how has that evolved over the years? In certain spaces, it's gotten better. I think on, on television, it's gotten a little better because, well, for example, one of the um, guest host of Yo! Was This Racist that I mentioned, um, Lucas Brown Eyes, in 2017, he actually sold the first, um, like, Native family sitcom ever. Like, it, it, it's, you know, hopefully, the, you know, television's a whole other thing that I, I, I don't even quite understand. Like, I would have been like, yeah, or it's a series, like, now, but clearly I'm biased. But, <laughs> so, I can see, it's strange because you can see I can see how it's gotten better because my dad was also, he was the toughest Pawnee and that kind of thing. So I always saw it through the eyes of people who, um, you know, grew up with that kind of representation uh, and, you know, that sort of thing. So I'd say it's gotten better. <laughs> You know, like, like it could be, it could be worse, but that's just because we have like all of history, all the gas. You know what I mean? Like, yes, it's better by comparison for sure. Um, but honestly, the unfortunate thing I see, like mostly on film and television, is how rare it is to have natives in control. Um, mm. And luckily, it's been happening much more with, like, indie projects. Uh, like, there's a great horror film out right now called Blood Quantum, which is all about, you know, uh, a reservation in Canada gets uh, infected, but the only people infected are non-Indigenous people. So it's just, like, a bunch of tough natives, like, fighting zombies, and it's uh, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> but for the most part, yeah, all of, like, the great thing there that are happening in, um, you know, the industry as far as natives are all like farther out on the spectrum where you know we really just want to like <laughs> they, people just really just want to get in there and like 
tell their stories without having to feel like they have to play a game, which, you know, is a huge ask, but at the same time, like, just do it. <laughs> because, you know, luckily things, at least in representation, have somewhat gotten better because, you know, on, um, you know, Yellowstone, we have at least a a lead who is playing a native character, but then, you know, the thing about native representation is that it also gets really dicey because, you know, um, and I can speak on this further, but, you know, there are also people who are like, oh, yeah, you know, I have, like, a great-great-great-grandmother who was native, and then does that entitle them to play native roles and that kind of thing? Like, for example, the person I'm speaking about on Yellowstone um, I'm sorry, this kind of got away from the topic of the first question. You're not um, sorry, you're sensational. That's right. How dare you love that? <laughs> um, <laughs> but unfortunately, um, I can't remember her name right now because I think I just refuse to commit it to memory because I know what's happening. But mm -hmm. so she's playing, you know, a, a native person on screen and she came out saying like, yes, I'm a member of the Eastern uh, Band of Cherokee, which is you know, uh, a, a sect of um, the Ch Cherokee Nation that is still, you know, in North Carolina and Georgia uh, on our ancestral homelands because they were some of the only ones who, like, hid out in the woods and were able to hide from the Georgia Guard. Another fun topic is the Trail of Tears we can do down the road. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> but the, what I find to be kind of hysterical and also very sad is the um, the Eastern Band Cherokee, who has very like strict documentation about these things because most tribes do, uh, <laughs> things like the Dawes Rolls. They're like, oh yeah, no, she <laughs> she is not and has never been a member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee. And so then it becomes tricky because like I you know one wouldn't want to you know um you don't want to like go on a witch hunt for some for a person like this because they may or, they may very well have like indigenous blood in their background but it's just kind of unfortunate and honestly sickening to see someone who has like who, you know even if they do have you know you know native blood they are so disassociated from the tribe in so many ways. And and I'll even say that personally as, like I'll add my own little grain of salt because I grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, away from um, the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, where my people are from. So obviously, you know, and I'm half Cherokee, like right down the middle. Um, and so then that bears the question, should that take me out of the running for certain kinds of roles and that kind of thing, which I'm completely open to that kind of discussion. But I think my friend Kenny puts it best. It's not about who you claim, it's about who claims you. Mm. And I can say that being an enrolled member. <laughs> so, that sounds like it comes up. Go, sorry, go ahead. No, no. Anna. I was just going to say, like, so it's so sort of like, um, where do you draw the line between, like, gatekeeping and, like, like being true to representation like yes yeah yeah and it's oh boy is it hard <laughs> because I'm you know sure. yeah uh, yeah just well just because you know with native native people specifically you know everyone and their grandma in this country has a story of like oh yeah you know your great 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 grandpappy married a cherokee princess or like you know uh <laughs> When in reality, <laughs> if you do have native blood, it's probably for much, much, much darker reasons than your family would ever want to discuss. Yes. Yeah. And then yeah. you also have a lot of people now doing genetic testing and finding out, oh, those stories that came from great grandma are not accurate. Exactly. Oh, if I could just, if I could just tell a quick little story, um, a friend of mine was, uh, dating this gal from Newport, who I uh, met a couple times before the pandemic started. And she was being like, first time meeting her, she was like, oh my God, you guys are native? I am too. I'm, <laughs> my, my 
great 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 uncle had uh, was married to like a Navajo princess or some something that I just like I heard it and then my brain was like delete and but then the funny part was then like a week or some change some change later we see them again and she's like yeah I got my test results back and it turns out I'm not Native American at all and I, I think to myself yeah I, could, I probably could have told you that and then she looks me dead in the eyes and just like, oh, I wish I was Native American. And I just stopped dead in my tracks. Just like, I remember me being polite. My response was like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. sure. I, I bet you do. When my internal reaction was, why? <laughs> why? Like, I get wanting to, you know, feel like an individual and have something that's like, especially yours, but you could do that with your own culture. You know, do some research, find out where your people are from. You could find something neat, I promise you. You don't have to co-opt a <laughs> a minority that has dealt with just like insane levels of, of suffering to be interesting, right? Like that's kind of where it all comes from is like, oh yeah, I, you know, I had an ancestor who was a Cherokee princess, so I get your struggle. I understand it. And it's like, really? You understand, like, living with, like, generational trauma and, like, why you may or may not be a six-year-old and just horrendously depressed for no reason? Like, it, it's kind of um, crazy to me, the people, the way that uh, people kind of, yeah, honestly, fetishize, uh, mm -hmm. like, Native yeah. American culture. Yeah, and there's a lot of that that is that's in in that story in particular. It's it's very much about like the individual and the ego, versus the heritage and the culture, and like I think you see that a lot. And that's I think also probably why you're seeing these misrepresentations because there are people who are like, well, I can, but I can identify instead of looking at it in a larger sense. You know, I dated a man from the Sioux tribe once, and I learned a lot from my two weeks with him. It's always that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. 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 Happens. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So did you, did you hear any of that kind of stuff, like, growing up as well? Like, you know, your family members in the industry or, you know, yourself when you first started breaking in? Um, not so much. The interesting thing that happened for me is I almost consistently had to justify my native identity, which I'll even say at, at that time in my life, especially, you know, going to college here at 19 years old, I was, I was just super confused because I didn't like go to school with a bunch of native kids necessarily. So even my own sense of identity was really just kind of shot out and all over the place. Um, but I do remember, like, one kind of positive thing that I just kind of wanted to make sure I talked about was um, the thing I remember being a kid, uh, being a kid, walking around with my dad, especially, like, going to powwows or, you know, doing, you know, celebrating Cherokee holiday in Oklahoma, was um, just the reaction of people, like, Native people who were genuine fans of his, right? And just to see their eyes, like, they just lit up. They were just, like, so happy that, A, he was there, and B, that he existed. Like, the fact that there was somebody who they felt at least broke the mold and was even, you know, uh, in a lot of, like, major films, like, just having that kind of representation for them was so important. And that always left like a, a huge impression on me. Um, maybe in a negative sense, just because the ego is like, I want to be that. <laughs> <laughs> but at the, same, at the same time, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was just really surreal. But then, you know, growing up, I was also kind of othered because, you know, not to sound super privileged like i'll check my privilege here but at my private school there weren't a lot of kids of color unfortunately um like it was me this kid 
Edgar, who was Mexican. <laughs> and that's it. Like, so for me, I was just kind of all over the place as, as far as like what it even meant to be like a native actor in in the industry. And you know, besides my dad didn't even really have like an an archetype to follow necessarily. Because even when you look at, you know, other natives who are in the industry like Jay Silver Beals and um, many, many others, it's like they were there, but they also always like tried to not be infected by it, if that makes sense. Like they always wanted to like hold on to their identity without, you know, feeling like they had to sell out their culture, which is so, so, so important to, you know, native folks because, you know. This, not to get back up on my soapbox and rally against the government again real quick, but like they tried so hard to erase us and, you know, when they weren't able to, it, it, our people, you know, our people are just so resilient. And I think that's all that I'm trying to get to. But um, the way it affected me is I was always very, very, very conscious of like what I would be stepping into, you know, as an actor following my dad's footsteps in that kind of way. So I was always very aware of like what it was going to be like in a, in a weird sense. Yeah. So we've alluded to it a couple of times, but your dad is the actor Wes Studi, um, who has over, I think 110 actor credits on IMDb, which is a lot. Um, so I guess my final question then um, is if you had a kid who would want to get involved in the industry, what would you say? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think my advice would be kind of akin to my dad's of just being like, really, you want to you wanna do this? Because, you know, I grew up, you know, my dad is, is you know, it's always such a, why did I choose to discuss this topic? It's always, um, <laughs> my dad is famous, which, God, I hate. <laughs> my dad's famous, but no, my dad is, is, is um, you know, is famous to a degree, right? And especially when you consider like Last Mohicans and Dances with Wolves, he was also an avatar, but I also grew up you know, understanding what the great droughts of not having work were. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you, you think of how little you actually see natives on television. And then you think about how little you see them in movies. That also correlates to how many parts there actually are out there. And he's also not going to get all of them. So, like, I was always very, very aware of what it was like to also, like, be a working actor in a sense. Because he did have a lot of success and has been, you know, he's great and he, he's very wise with like everything that he's done with it. But I was always very conscious of what like the reality of it was. It's not all the glitz and glamour all the time. It's not, you know, constantly being chauffeured around. It's like a lot of work and it's sometimes putting all of your effort and all of your being into something and then still not getting it. So, you know, I guess I just kind of like learned that you gotta be tough. You gotta be really tough, which is something I'm still working on because I'm a sensitive little snowflake. But <laughs> although that that's where that resilience comes into play, right? You'd hope so. You'd really hope so. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> well, you know. Although right now you're you're not in a drought. You you're working on three different projects right now, uh, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Somehow, <laughs> somehow in the midst of a pandemic, I found myself in, in just like an October whirlpool of stuff, and I'm so happy about it. Um, but yeah, so I'm guessing that's where you want me to talk about the three projects I'm working on. Well, yeah. Can you tell us about them? Of course. No, I can't. I'm actually under contract. It's a very uh, lengthy NDA. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> 
So the first, <laughs> the first thing I'm working on um, is with this uh, theater called Perseverance Theater, and it's uh, a theater up in Juneau, Alaska. And um, here is how I will describe the spirit of the valley. Uh, Spirit of the Valley is a theater for youth production set in Tlingit country in Alaska. Two twins set out to find out why the Spirit of the Valley swept away everything, including their parents, fish camp, and cabin. And it's basically just like this fun uh, storytelling adventure uh, through Tlingit culture, but also, you know, adding, you know, modern ties to it. So the role I'm playing is actually three separate wolves who are consistently talking to each other. Um, at one point, they were like, why don't we make this one wolf? And then <laughs> Frank, the writer, was like, nah, 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 nah. Let, let, let's see how, how people do with this. And apparently I was the only lunatic to, <laughs> to just try it as three separate entities talking to each other. And it worked. So... <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. But it's a it's a really fun, delightful show, and it's going to be um, playing on Zoom through Perseverance Theater, and uh, that's you can get tickets at ptalaska.org, and it's family friendly. It'll be running for uh, two weekends in November, two or three, uh, and it's and it's just a really fun project. A lot of great people are on it, and uh, I can't recommend it enough. The Second thing I'm also working on is I am doing, I guess it's kind of become like a radio play for New Native Theater, which is a great company out of the uh, Twin Cities area that's all about. <laughs> so it takes place in a world where a zombie virus infects uh, a town and a reservation, and it infects specifically um, white people and then uh, full-blood natives. And so people like me, who are mixed, <laughs> are actually completely ignored by any zombies whatsoever, which is just, you know, a great allegory for how uh, people see people like me sometimes, you know, because if you're not enrolled, are you really native? Um, ah. So it dives into that while also just being a fun, silly zombie feature. Uh, so check that out coming out around, um, I think they're really pushing it so it'll come out around Halloween, perfect for spooky season. And then it's finally, <laughs> Finally, after this long list of plugs, uh, I am doing the short play festival for Native Voices of the Autry, which will also be online, coming to you in November. And um, the whole, the theme of this year's short play festival is more than moccasins, and it's exploring, you know, Native identity um, outside of appropriation and that kind of thing. Like, um, how do we as Native people identify with our culture while still wanting to be active in the modern world and that kind of thing. And also, you know, it deals with how uh, the world also views us. So fun, light topics. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, that'll also be uh, coming in November. And somehow I am uh, directing one of them, uh, stage managing one of them, and am acting in one of them. But if you want to come see a series of great uh, short plays by native artists. I, I cannot recommend it enough. And I'll send all the proper links to you guys so you can send all of your fans those things. Fantastic. Excellent. So, you know, you're sitting around doing nothing right now. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do it all. So, do you, yeah, always doing nothing. Do you have any like theaters or organizations that you would recommend people check out? Yes, uh, I highly recommend checking out New Native Theater because they're just doing, um, in this wacky Zoom era of, of theater, which is, oh boy, is it just kind of the worst. A lot of people are finding great, clever ways to get around it, though, and New Native Theater, um, they're just awesome. And also support Native Voices of the Autry because they're, Mission Statement is literally trying to get uh, new Native voices out there in the world and produce their works. They're a terrific company. I can't, you know, recommend them enough. Um, and if you want some fun uh, 
native clothing, go check out um, Urban Native Era on Instagram. So you can buy, you can support in a, a native artist without feeling like you're appropriating their culture by buying their stuff. Huh. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. And you'll but, definitely give us the info for this, right? So we can share it with everyone. Yes, I can. And I apologize to the audience and you guys, because that one was right off the cuff. That was like, what's another thing I could mention? I feel like I need for free. <laughs> Good things come in threes. Exactly, exactly. This is good so jokes. Of course. And, you know, it sounds like you have a lot of clown experience and your three wolves. Are, did you base those? I mean, this is completely off the cuff, too. Did you base those, like, at, in the clown home? Oh, that's a good question. In a way, I think I, you know, I think I did unintentionally because they're just kind of like three odd archetypes because yeah, one of them is just an angry old cockney wolf who always talks like this. And then the other is just kind of a borderline offensive German interpretation of an intellectual. And then the other is just, you know, <laughs> kind of Matthew McConaughey around. But <laughs> high school girls, though. what a creep. Oh! <laughs> But yeah, in a way, I think I definitely, I think that's where a lot of like my own personal um, <laughs> application came from was just clowning because it's just not just not holding yourself with any restraints in any way. It's just allowing yourself to be funky and weird and also in a weird way, very serious, but sometimes being very serious can be very funny. Um, Absolutely. So, that question i am sorry because i haven't like properly clowned in a very long time uh yeah so in a way i did i think i did base like the three characters off of you know just clowning well in my experience to... once a clown always a always clown. a clown it's I always mean, in there do you see my bow tie like i cannot leave it it's <laughs> 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 Oh. Well, if there was if there was one thing that you were like, I need to leave people with this today, or I can't leave today without saying this thing, what would that be? Go vote. <laughs> yes. Please. Yes. yes. Uh. Just on the general sense, go vote. Please, please vote. I mean, oh, just do the thing. Um. But in terms of like what we've been discussing, I think what I want to take, what I want your viewers to take away is just think about what being an ally to the native people in your life truly means, you know. And if you don't have any in your life and are interested in these kinds of things, go read some, you know. Uh, Go read some great stuff from uh, native authors, like "They're There" by Tommy Orange, and that kind of thing. Just, just don't forget that we're here because we're active parts of the community all over the country, and just truly love the land that Creator gave us. And you know, just keep us in mind because a lot of indigenous kids are having, you know, not to bring it down, but unfortunately the rates of teen suicide amongst native kids is just off the charts. And it's because of this sense of hopelessness, you know, not only on the reservation, but just like through, you know, how the media views us and that kind of thing. So just keep us in our, in your minds, but also don't pity us because we're some of the strongest mofos out there and some of the best allies you'll ever have. Period. Beautiful. Thank yeah. you. Colin, thank you for that. Thank you for bringing your humor and your resilience and reminder to, to look outside of ourselves and, and ego and to vote, 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 yes. vote. All of you out there, go vote. Go <laughs> yes. So thank you for, for carving time out of this hectic schedule to come and talk with us today. It is always such a pleasure to be in the Zoom room with you. And hopefully one day we can, we can eventually do this in person. 
And uh, for all of you out there watching, thank you for being here and uh, for supporting uh, Kolan and his work. And we'll post all of the uh, shows and authors and places you can shop uh, in our blog so that you can go and support uh, Kolan and some, some other awesome artists out there. Uh, next week, we will be talking with Chuck Obasi, one of our accountability and advisory board members about the invisible caste system in America and how that affects theater. Uh, and uh, next week, we have a workshop that Jaina will be teaching, uh, yes. which is going to help you raise your voice. Yes, we will be projecting. talking about projecting. So please register for that. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, and then we have some other stuff coming up. So uh, check out our website, which is thumbprintstudios.org, if you haven't done so before. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for being here. And Kolan. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Till next time.